So uh, an interesting thing here, the Museum of Flight was founded in 1965, and uh, this year, 2015, marks our 50th anniversary, uh, which we've been celebrating all year. Uh, so it's fitting, then, that today's topic, uh, uh, the wild weasels, also turns 50 years old this year. In 1965, the introduction of Soviet surface-to-air missiles in the skies over Vietnam was taking an alarming toll on U.S. strike aircraft. The wild weasel program was developed by the U.S. Air Force to counter this threat. Uh, here today to talk about the development and operation of the wild weasels are two fantastic gentlemen, both wild weasel pilots themselves, Dan Barry and Rod Mott. So to begin our program about the wild weasels today, please welcome to the stage Colonel Dan Barry. <laughs> Thanks, Cale. Um, I've told Cale that uh, the only thing I like to do more than talk about flying is flying. And um, so to avoid uh, stepping on Rod's presentation, when my timer goes off or Cale brings out the hook, um, I'll, I'll try to make this fast. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming out and uh, seen a bit about wild weasels. I'll talk about the Vietnam portion and uh, Rod will bring it up uh, to more modern. I will back up here. <clears throat> this is the weasel model. I also flew the D model, single seat uh, strike airplane. The 105 is uh, usually listed as the largest single engine jet fighter ever built. Uh, we 54,000 pounds at takeoff, carried more bombs than a B-17. <clears throat> and the downside of that was uh, it was placarded to fly final approach with no ordnance, uh, recovery fuel, 198 knots. So we almost rivaled the space shuttle. Um, I will have... Uh, couple of disclaimers. One of them is I'm just going to talk about Wild Weasel, which was the Air Force program. For those of you that are familiar with the Navy program, normally I think it was usually called Iron Hand. Um, they use different airplanes, different tactics. They, uh, the Air Force used a lot of Navy missiles. So they did have a program and wouldn't want you to think that it was just an Air Force show to suppress enemy air defense. Um, the other disclaimer is uh, the two-seater uh, had an electronic warfare officer in the back seat. In the Vietnam era, he was known as the Bear. Uh, and the Bear didn't want you to call him an Ewo, he didn't want you to call him a Gib, he didn't want you to call him anything but the Bear. They were a fierce group, and the Air Force didn't have enough money uh, for me to get in the back seat of that uh, weasel airplane. It, uh, sitting back there in a kind of a pit, limited visibility, uh, focusing on the electronic warfare equipment while the pilots got you upside down and uh, stuff was, wouldn't be an easy job. Uh -huh. There we go. And this is basically what I'll, what I'll be talking about. And I'll try to get through it without using too many acronyms. The ones you might hear, SAMs, surface to air missiles, ARMS, anti-radiation missiles, uh, I may slip and use a couple of others, but those are the ones I might fall into. Uh, this first item up here about 1959, uh, the RB-57 being the first casualty to a SAM. After I uh, asked Cale's folks to do my slides, I have found info after that that said that RB-57 was really lost to a MiG but I, had, I forget the source on uh, being a SAM loss, but um, in any event, uh, don't bet anybody a beer on that one. Um, we're all familiar pretty much with Gary Powers' loss over Russia. 
then we lost one over Cuba to a SAM. Uh, and the Chinese were flying uh, U-2s over China, uh, the ROC Chinese, and lost quite a number. Um, at the bottom there, I missed putting the date on there, which is really significant, 1965. And that was the first F-4 lost, uh, or the first Air Force airplane lost in Vietnam, uh, Leopard 2. Uh, flight of four, uh, they had been bombing up north, they had seen the sites being built up, but they were restricted. We weren't allowed uh, to, to bomb the sites at that time because they knew the equipment was coming from Russia. They figured uh, they had Russian advisors, they didn't want to get in a flap with the Russians, and so they were off limits. And uh, sure enough, they let them build them up and um, lost an airplane and many more to follow. Uh, one of the things I learned that kind of surprised me is uh, the pilot of that Leopard 2 that was lost, uh, Captain Kiern, I believe is his name, um, he'd been a German a POW in, uh, of the Germans in World War II, which was, uh, we have sitting down here Joe Krecka, I, uh, I mentioned Joe for, uh, I may mention him later. Uh, Joe is, maybe there's more of you in the room, but Joe for sure maybe could stay in the question and answer session and uh, he can tell you what it's like to get shot down by a SAM. About a year after this loss, he was shot down and uh, ended up at about a seven year POW. So Joe can tell you what a, Sam hits really like. Uh, final thing about this particular loss, that first one, they took them off the no bomb list a uh, day or two, three days later. They cranked up 46 F-105s to go up and just blow that site off the face of the earth. And uh, they showed up. Uh, there were no missiles there. They had lots of guns there. And in that 46 uh, airplane strike force, six were shot down to, due to AAA. So um, SAMs weren't the only threat. Uh, this is the beginning, Wild Weasel 1. It was the F-100. They knew the SAM threat was building. They had a kind of a crash program, excuse the term to uh, put a bunch of uh, prototype electronics into uh, seven F-100s. Uh, it was a very um, secret program at the time. Nobody talked about it. And uh, they deployed very rapidly, went over. The trouble was they had difficulty staying up with the F-105 strike force. Uh, the equipment was uh, really basic. They could kind of home on a SAM site. They couldn't tell how far out they were. They could then pick it up with their eyeball and try to direct, you put ordnance on it and direct the F-105s with them to bomb it. So they did manage to, to kill some sites, but uh, it wasn't easy and it was really primitive. Uh, those four airplanes that initially deployed they, in six weeks, they'd lost two of them. Uh, they sent the remaining three over. Uh, they lost one of those and they finally closed up that operation in, uh, in July of 66. Uh, Wild Weasel 2, I'll keep that brief because it never worked. It, uh, they tried to uh, put equipment in much like they used for Wild Weasel 1. They had wiring problems. Uh, they didn't have places to put antennas. Uh, that made the airplane go slow, fly funny, and so it just never really uh, uh, got going until uh, Wild Weasel 4 came along. Wild Weasel 3 is the one that uh, 
flew most of the war. Uh, it uh, had better equipment. Uh, one of the big things about it was it carried an AGM, air-to-ground missile, um, 45, a Shrike. So all at once, they could hopefully home on the site, and then they, didn't, they weren't stuck with just dropping hard bombs. Uh, they could put a missile on it. Uh, that first group... Uh, by that time, of course, people knew what they were getting into when they got into wild weasels. Um, that first group sent six F-105s to Karat, Thailand, five to Tok Lee. Uh, they could, of course, keep up with the, the strike force because the, the two-seater would go just as fast as the single-seater. Um, but at the end of six weeks, of those 11 airplanes that deployed over there, there were only four left. Um, they had a lot of losses. They were learning all the time, but uh, it, it was uh, a lot of costly lessons. They uh, then came and modified the Fs uh, to the G model. And probably the big difference there which doesn't show too well on that lower picture. Uh, there, kind of underneath the back seat, you can see a little bit of a blister. It had a jammer built into the airplane. In my missions over there, only had that jammer turned on once. Uh, because if you turn it on, it killed your weasel equipment. It, uh, you couldn't see anything. Um, although that one time we turned it on may have saved our life, so uh, it, it wasn't inconsequential. Uh, the big thing is it got the AGM-78, which was a smarter missile. Uh, the AGM-45 wouldn't uh, oh, go seven to nine miles, depending on the distance uh, or your altitude. Uh, the AGM-78 would uh, advertise 60 miles, probably more realistically, about 45. Um, jumping ahead now to the, this was kind of the outcome of the Wild Weasel II. Uh, they did make uh, the war in Vietnam uh, right before the Christmas bombing, uh, but they were handicapped in a way they didn't have that AGM-78 missile. Uh, here's a little bit about the training. Um, the, we ch went, to, uh, were in classes uh, at the time I was there, five or six crews, about 10 or 12 people in each class. Class ran about a month. Uh, everybody was a volunteer. Um, the bears came from usually SAC bombers. Uh, the pilots came out of fighter squadrons. You had to have a um, minimum of 500 hours of fighter time. Uh, had to be a flight leader. And uh, had to be recommended by your squadron you were leaving. Somebody recently uh, asked me, did you always know why they were recommending you leave? Uh, I'd never really thought about it that way, but I guess it's something to think about. Um, and as I said, that, that first class that flew in the F-100s, uh, Jack Donovan is the guy attributed to this quote because those guys being the first ones, uh, you couldn't even utter the word wild weasel. And they, so the word wasn't out what they did till they volunteered for the project and got there and then found out. And that was what Jack's quote was. Uh, you've got to be kidding me or whatever. Uh, Jack uh, was unduly concerned, although he passed away here just a few months ago, but of natural causes. That's, uh, that's what the weasel mission was all about, not totally, but primarily, to get rid of the SAM. It's uh, 35 feet long, it's um, been talked about as being like a telephone pole. I never saw one that looked like a telephone pole. 
Um, it uh, had a 420 pound warhead, had a four to five second booster that got it off the pad. It uh, was guided from the ground. It um, had a 210 foot proximity fuse and uh, it had a bunch of um, shrapnel that came out, I think 18, 8,000, 8,000 fragments uh, that would um, really cover a large area. Uh, it went about Mach 2.5. Uh, the big thing about which pertains to any mission that I've been involved in, um, even though you've got all kinds of electronic equipment, your Mark, Mark I Mod O eyeball is what'll save you. You have to see what's happening. And one of the problems is with that SAM, you might see it come off the pad, but usually they were uh, camouflaged, they were in jungles, whatever. So if you happen to be looking out the right side of the airplane and the SAM launches off the left, by the time your scan gets over there, it's already on its way. They'd like to get you in about 12 to 15 miles, although their range could reach 20. Um, so if it's only going 12 miles or so, Mach 2.5, it's clicking along at you know 25 miles a minute. So in 30 seconds, that's if you're looking at it, it's going to be with you in 30 seconds. So you really had to, seeing was a, was a big deal. Uh, those little winglets were um, fairly stubby, uh, so it made it fairly easy to outmaneuver, but again, you had to see it. And um, I can stand here and say it's fairly easy to outmaneuver, but... Uh, never seemed quite that way. Um, the missile was guided by the Fansong radar. Um, up in the upper right hand corner there's a, a classic missile site that was probably seen in Russia or something. <clears throat> I never saw anything like that in Vietnam. They were all camouflaged and hidden. Um, the one thing I will mention, the fan song eventually got a, one of those boxes, uh, had an optical sighting capabil capability, and a guy could uh, lay or stand uh, in that box and provide optic sighting so they didn't have to turn their radar on. The, um, in the course of time that I was over there, it was uh, night and day. Initially, they would turn that radar on and track you and stuff like that. Um, then we got the missiles that could home in on the radar, so they started tracking you from other sites and triangulating you and, and letting the firing site know so the missile came off the pad and the radar came on at the same time. So you didn't have near the warning. Uh, fire can radar, this was for uh, AAA and most of the losses over there by, by far were to AAA, they weren't to SAMs. The SAMs were very effective, they knocked down a lot of airplanes, but they were effective for one way in you put a SAM in the air and it really screws, screws the situation up. People, you know, they're getting ready to roll in on a dive bomb run and all at once they, they've got to be worried about SAMs. And, um, but the things that knocked most people down was AAA. These are the altitudes that those various um, guns would go to. The higher you were, like if you're up at 20,000 feet, uh, whether it's radar guided or in this case optical tracking, as long as you were jinking 
if you're at 20,000 feet every 20 seconds, or if you're at 5,000 feet, you wanted to jink every five seconds because it takes that round that long to get to you. Um, that doesn't um, protect you from the golden BB, you know, a gunner uh, over leads or something like that and gets you. Um, weapons uh, against the gun. Um, you, as soon as you start getting down in that 5,000 foot range, uh, you know, they, they just had so much firepower um, that even making dive bomb runs, if you're bottoming out at five, you've got a lot of, a lot of flack. Um, if you think you want to be strafing, you're going to be down in that 3,000 foot area and uh, there was just, in fact, we didn't, uh, we had a squadron policy that we didn't strafe except for a SAR. Well, there's my 20 minutes. I'll run quickly through these. MiGs, what can you say? Great airplane, hard to see. Um, I had a friend who was a um, 105 guy, a lot of tours, and he said if there was any such thing as reincarnation, he wanted to come back as a MiG pilot at Hanoi. It, uh, um, this is a Barlock radio radar search radar, um, and there's the AGM-78, weighed uh, about 1,800 pounds, I think it was. Um, good warhead, except it had a high fail rate, and I'll go into that some other time. Um, heavy load to get off the ground. Uh, weasel tactics, that's about a three hour brief. Um, here's, this is just the weasel losses. Uh, that's how they shook out. Um, and I might mention drop tanks. Uh, dropping tanks off airplanes uh, can be dangerous and we lost two with tanks coming off squirrely. Ground impact, I'm not too sure what that one is, although one of our pilots, great uh, guy, test pilot school instructor, uh, we had water injection to, in the 105 to give you 2,000 extra pounds of thrust to get you off the ground, and um, he lost water at a critical point. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rod, and um, I'll try to field any questions at the end of the end of the program. Uh, just so you know, that's an airplane that I uh, crewed in uh, Southern Watch. They let us put our names and some things on the airplane, which is probably, you know, politic not really uh, allowed a lot of times, but once you go to combat, they let you do things. You, you all have seen Robin Olds with his mustache and all the other stuff, but, but anyway, we were allowed to put that on. Uh, coming from Texas A&M, coming from, coming from Texas A&M, that's a hard thing to put on your airplane because that's a fight song for the University of Texas, okay? But uh, you might see it later on, that uh, was uh, what my father's airplane in World War II. So it looks just about in the same thing. Okay, enough. Okay, there's a, a little bit of the patches, you know, and you look at it uh, that are associated with the F4G, the Wild Weasel II. This program, am I, am I okay? Okay. This program uh, really took the weasel mission, things that we were doing with what we call fuzz busters, you know, like you have in the car for your radar detector. These guys, you know, were doing that. They'd, you know, maybe just line of bearing, no range and all that. Finally, we get the Atari 65 computer or 64 computer, you know, put in an airplane. You know, it can do all these fabulous things, you know. We got an upgrade to the Commodore 128, you know, sometime later after that. But anyway, it put it in the airplane and really gave us an opportunity now to have an aircraft, you know, really dedicated, uh, very capable aircraft to do this weasel mission. Okay, along his, again, Wild Weasel 4 pro or 5 program is the 
F4G, I'll talk about some of the weasel training, the threats, weapons and tactics. I don't want to keep everybody here forever. So really afterwards, uh, Dan will continue his presentation. We'll be able to talk a little bit more, get into more detail for those who wanted to ask more questions. So I'll try to meet my time uh, period also. Uh, e, F4G. Basically, the neat thing about the F4E is it's got that big nose gun. Got that big, ugly front end to the thing. Well, they took out the nose gun, and that gave us a chance to put that Atari computer up in the front, okay? Along with a whole bunch of antennas, I think a total of about 120 of them on the airplane, usually in five or six arrays up on the tail, up in the dome, up on the nose, either side of the chin, up in the wings. But anyway, we you know lots of antennas on the thing in order to to figure out our big job is locating where they are, range and bearing to the threats and the number of threats that you can cover. Uh, cockpit upgrade for the back seat to manage the electronic combat environment. Uh, I'll show you a picture a little bit later. Basically, you can't see out the front. In the old F4, you could, but when you did that, uh, you take a look at it. I mean, uh, landing from the, only way you can safely land it from the back seat is if you never see the runway. If you see any part of the runway, you're too far over. You ain't gonna make it. Uh, I landed from the back seat of an F4E, you know, but I haven't done it from an F4G, and I don't think I want to try it. But 134 F4G models, uh, first in 75, squadron service in 78. So I'm coming in probably after, uh, you know, it's kind of matured as a weapon system. Really kind of hard to see here, but uh, uh, if you kind of look at it, really not a whole lot of difference in the in the in the front seat. Front seat, basically what they did was they gave us a, a little controller box. There was a repeater of a 12-inch scope in the back. And that, uh, let's see, I think I got the pointer here. Should always pre-flight my equipment. Yeah, this big 12-inch scope here from the back seater. There's his radar. He's got all the stuff in the F4. They just plugged this whole thing in here and moved this, you know, your, your flight instruments up to where you, now you can't see out the front. That's your whole, you know, normally that would be looking at the back of the front seater's head right about there, okay? That panel there would be here and you'd be able to see something here. But anyway, that's the, the guts of the system. This whole panel right here uh, allowed them to become, you know, now a dedicated weapon system. And then there's a few things over here. This is a navigation we upgraded. You know, we moved into inertial navigation system, ARN 101, you know, really into, uh, you know, can, high-speed avionics. Okay, Okay, training, yeah, you take a look at it. Uh, you know, backseater is, I started, I uh, started actually in uh, navigator training. Then uh, you move on to electronic warfare officer. These are the guys that really make the weasel mission. They're the specialists. You know, we call them beeps and squeaks, because again, you're gonna listen, it's audio, it's visual, it's knowing all the parameters of the weapons. Uh, you know, training for that, when I was going through, we had a, uh, basically it was a B-52G, the electronic warfare officer simulator seat. You, they have SAMs thrown at you, you know, and you try to counteract those with different types of jamming and other things. Um, when you look at it, basically, uh, those EWOs would go out, uh, mission-ready experience pilots. In other words, they were looking for people with 500 hours because this was, you know, kind of a... Uh, tough mission, doing uh, all these other things that wasn't for the initial pilot. So basically, just to get into the weasel program from the front seat, you had to have uh, 500 hours. Uh, RTU uh, replacement training was done at George Air Force Base. Uh, Post-Gulf War, we got a little bit less specialized in that basically, we were looking for any F-4 qualified crew could be put into that. Same thing for the back seat, a WISO. Uh, could go actually through there and come right to, direct to the squadron. And uh, interesting enough, because we had shut down, they only, there was only two bases, one of them in the guard at Boise, one of them at, uh, at uh, Nellis, uh, you know, op uh, operational at Nellis. So all the, all the training was done uh, in the guard and reserve at uh, Boise. I went through that as part of the requalification training prior to going to Nellis after the Gulf War. Okay, Dan went through the SAMs. You know, you look at it, it started off with just that, that uh, the SA-2. They started to get a few of the SA-3s, you know, in Vietnam, post-Vietnam, Cold War syndrome. 
all the other stuff. You look at the proliferation. I won't go into them. I mean, but the thing about it is we had to be prepared. This one here, really, not so much. That's a big strategic SAM. But the things that we started, you know, hey, we could handle the two. That's not too bad. We can handle the three. We know that. But now we get much more sophisticated. The six and the follow-on, the 11. The, this is the IR SAMs. Now we start to come into play. You know, these are the handheld Stinger missile kind of thing. Started off with Red Eye Stinger, Stinger 2 and all that. Yeah, they're doing that too. When you look at it, you know, sorry, a whole... Uh, you know, a whole line here. These are all just improvements, essentially the same missile. SA-8, and this was a this was a big one in the Gulf War. Uh, very tactical, Sam. Very mobile, wheeled vehicle, multiple missiles, missile you know reload capability. They'd fire from the time of firing. They could be on the run in 30 seconds after they fired. So it's a tough one, you know, when you get these mobile things. Nine, uh, 13, same type of thing, but it's an IR missile. Uh, quite a bit uh, more short range. Uh, right now, you know, we were just dealing with the 10s and the 12s uh, you know, in the, uh, when the F4G went out of the inventory, but those things are, are real killers, and they're out there now. I'm sure we've got other stuff to keep working on those. Of course, when, when you're dealing that weasel mission, you've got to consider all the different other things. Uh, you know, there's friendly SAMs now. In the Gulf War, this was a real problem because we had the French allies. Well, you know, the French sold them pretty much everything. They sold them F-1, so we had the aircraft. That was a problem. Uh, they had uh, uh, the Crotal missile system, so that was out there. So how do you tell the difference between a friendly one and an enemy one? So a lot of times we could not shoot these, uh, especially after the hostilities where you can't really mark where they are on either side of a line. We had to stop shooting... Uh, uh, you know, Crotals. Roland was a uh, German missile that was sold there. The Hawk, that's our own. Iraq had a whole bunch of the Hawk missiles also. Uh, so again, we had to be able to sort these things out. Rapier was a French missile. Uh, AAA, yeah, we had all those other AAAs. Uh, probably the one that uh, ZSU-23-4. Man, this thing was a killer below 10,000 feet. You know, gun dish radar, really high PR, you know, basically great accuracy. So that was the one that we were really concerned about. The other stuff, really, you couldn't do too much about it. Most of it was kind of a barrage stuff. Fighter threats, yeah, yeah. Again, Vietnam, you're into the sorry, you're into the the 21 with an AR, AA2 Atoll IR, basically a rear hemisphere. You know, you look at it, you see the airplane, eh, you know, that's okay. You come and engage. What you're doing is you're trying to keep keep him off your tail end. You know because that's the only place he can employ missiles. Um, when you start to get some improvements, you know, the, the radar missile, you, know, you can shoot you, shoot what we call shoot you in the face. You know, you shoot your side on the beam, you can shoot you from the air, basically an all aspect type missile, you know, with a, but there's some limitations to them as far as maneuverability and range and all that. Really what I'm showing in here is, you know, the, the fighter aircraft, um, the fighter aircraft, uh, you know, we really started to carry a lot more missiles and a lot more variation, a lot more capable missiles. When you look at it, by the time we get around to the Gulf War, we're looking at MiG-29s with AA-10 Alamo and AA-11 Archers. What does that mean? It means that, you know, they were pretty much the equivalent of what we had. Uh, we're working against the same type of threat. Su-27 didn't have too many of those, but again, they're dealing uh, a lot with Mirage F-1s, the French had sent uh, it'd give them a lot of uh, Mirage F1s, but all of these were, were in, in the threat range. Weapons. Um, we still had the uh, Shrike AGM-45. The 78 had pretty much been taken out of the inventory. Uh, replaced really one weapon, do, you know, pretty much does it all, AGM-88, the high-speed anti-radiation missile, or HARM, as we call it. And that was really, you know, the paired... Uh, missile for the system that we have on the F4G, you know, really a great pair. And probably the biggest limitation is when we put these things on the airplane, if we're going to go anywhere, we need three bags of gas, especially if we're carrying these things. So usually the big problem was you only had two of them. Uh, we got an improved centerline tank, uh, shorter ranges and all that. We had the ability, like in, the, in Kuwait, 
just going over the border into Kuwait, maybe we could do fly with four of these. And that was very helpful. But most of the time we were limited, especially if you're going as far as Baghdad, basically two missiles and you're done. Well, you know, you can expend that. If you expend those in your first five minutes of a 30, 30 minute, you know, time on station, you know, uh, you're, you're kind of out of luck. So you got to be careful on, on the use of those. AGM-65 Maverick, again, so what we do, rather than using the harm missile all the time, a lot of times uh, they'll use a countermeasure where they'll come up, they'll look for a while, they realize we can shoot them, and if they stay on the air very long, then they need, they'll drop off so that maybe, you know, and the missile has some memory to it, so it'll go after it. But a lot of times, you know, this is that, that countermeasure, counter, countermeasure, counter, counter, countermeasure. But what we would do is actually have another, other weapons that maybe we can continue the attack with. Um, we'd follow up, you know, and be uh, with a mixed load, sometime carrying Maverick or CBU, cluster bomb munitions, a um, couple of different variations. One of them, you know, combined effects, so it's blast and frag, so it's really against all targets. We could mine an area so they couldn't go back in if they were there. Sensor fuse weapon is against harder targets and armor but different types of uh, cluster bombs to do that. Uh, air to air, we still had the AIM-7 and AIM-9 for our own self-defense. Weasel tactics, really we've developed this concept called SEED, suppression of enemy air defenses. It's been around for a while, but it wasn't just us. A lot of people, you know, they say, you know, they get an idea. It's actually a triad, what we were doing as a triad. We would team up with uh, EF-111s, EA-6B Prowler, and basically they would provide electronic jamming. What the jamming would do is take out a lot of the early warning threat radars, basically blind them so that we could actually get in a little closer to do our business. They wouldn't know what we were doing. We'd come in, that was in force protection, so we'd be coming in with a package either before or after it. And as a complement to that, we had the AC-130 Compass Call, which was doing the communications jamming. A lot of times if you have these guys in the field, they're trying to communicate with each other, pass information verbally. And if we can jam those voice communications also, all three of those were in kind of synergistic effect to take them off and keep them down, if not to, you know, not to kill them, at least to keep them down while we're all exposed and, and while the, uh, the strikers are going in to take out the target. One of the things that when I first got to, uh, uh, to Spang Dalam in 86, you know, we're at the height of the Cold War. Uh, U.S. has deployed uh, the ground launch cruise missiles and the short-range nukes. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's really pretty, uh, the Cold War is pretty hot at that point. Again, we're trying to figure out how we can, we can stop the, the big hordes coming over at full the gap, okay? I've been there on the ground looking at it, you know, all the tanks, all the other stuff, and they're going to come in with a full complement of mobile SAMs and AAAs. So in order to increase the firepower of the F4G, what we did was we formed up what we call a hunter-killer team. And they did this in Vietnam a little bit too. We have a weasel airplane that can target, and that IFO there, we're carrying three tanks, and we have two of these harm missiles. But now we can take an F-16 along with us, and then we can put two harm missiles on him. He has no capability to, to pre-target those missiles. But what we've got is on this F-16, we have an, uh, an ALEC air launch uh, uh, interconnect. And what we can do is we can pass data from our harm targeting system to that missile, offload that information, and he can fire it. So basically, you know, he's like a, like a reload capability for us. So if we're flying out there, I can actually use him. I can target his missiles for him. The neat compliment was, you know, we kind of worried about this when it first started. You know, was how are we going to employ this? You know, at this point, our radar, our air-to-air -air radar, we can employ AIM-7s pretty well, but we just can't find anything out there. He's got a great radar, but he has no radar missile. They didn't have AMRAM at this point. So he, a lot of times we'd be flying along. He could find them, tell us where they were. We could lock them up and shoot them with the AIM-7, where we would never find them before if we didn't know where to look. 
Likewise, he's got AIM-9 Limas. We didn't have the cooled rails at the point. So again, he was a great air defender for us. Uh, great maneuverability in a, in a close-end dogfight. So, you know, he would usually take over in that, that type of a defensive role, whereas we were uh, you know, in here as far as the wild weasel mission control and that. So he was a great pair, and we doubled the firepower. We took uh, essentially one squadron of weasels in Germany, spread it over three squadrons, and we had that, you know, base, uh, a force multiplier. Uh, Gulf War, I'll tell you, this, this scenario here, because of the SAMs, drove us down into a lower restricted operating zones. Basically, our job was to blast a hole in the forward line of the troops to get them through. We were operating essentially in that, probably in that uh, anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 foot range, trying to stay on the friendly side of the battle so we didn't get chewed up by the ZSU-23-4 or AAA, but you know, far enough back that we'd be able to work the SAMs. If you got up higher than that, too many SAMs, you get shot down. Any lower than that, crashing to the ground and all, but the strikers were even lower than that. Funny thing happened on the way to the Gulf War was uh, you know, that all that changed. You know, somehow or another, we went up to medium altitude. That was a way to survive. Everybody was getting shot down at the low altitudes. The F4G was probably a lot more effective than we thought at suppressing the SAMs. Probably wasn't as dense and weren't as good of operators also as what we had thought you know, the Soviets would be. We were in a much more pervasive environment, you know, flat land, desert, and all the other stuff, not as much camouflage. So what we started in the air tasking order was embedding ourselves with a strike package, basically an escort. You know, if there, were, if there were 16 airplanes going to a target, we'd escort them in, get there first, suppress them over the, the time over target, come back with them. We were like, you know, the old P-51s with the B-17s, basically their escort the whole way, but but really as uh, air to surface rather than air to air. And we had air cap also. It was kind of escort going with these also had AF-15s. And it worked really good, uh, you know, in the escort role. Uh, in the very end, we came up with, you know, what we call weasel police. And we kind of divided the whole area up into, into grids. And we'd send up, you know, usually a six ship. We'd take two airplanes on station at any time, basically to be able to react because we didn't have enough weasels and we were hitting so many targets and it had gotten permissive at that point. And basically we were just up there kind of sitting there on call, you know, like a fireman. And we, you know, through a grid we'd run over there and we'd suppress anything that this one strike, five minutes later we'd move to the next strike, five minutes later the next strike, so we could actually support two or three, four, five, six packages with just the two of us. And then also we'd cycle in and off the tanker, so out of those six airplanes we always had two two to four on station at any one time ready to respond. Okay, Weasel tactics, I'm getting close on mine. A uh, couple of things on that, you know, when you learn to work at the, the guy in the back, the EWO was the one that telling us how to work all the targets and all that. But a couple of things because of the system, uh, low altitude ranging, what you try to do is you try to fly and you wanted to cut arc around a threat like that, because the more arcs you get, you can tell the range. Range is a tough thing. Azimuth is pretty easy to tell, but as you get a couple of arcs like that, then you can actually triangulate on that pattern. Uh, if you're up at, at higher altitude, you can use what they call 3D ranging off the thing, and that gives you an ability now to build that, that, that 3D picture from altitude also, so you can actually tell where the site is. So, those are the things that we're trying to do. You have to maneuver in relation to the target in order to get a good solution. And when you do get a good solution, you can come in and if you're attacking the target on your own. Uh, offset pops, uh, a lot of times this is a, a weapons delivery. It keeps you in the low altitude area initially, so you're not susceptible to the SAM. You minimize your time up high, and you'll come in, you get a good dive angle, and you come in off the target. And we would do the same thing. Uh, a lot of times when we're coming in for those close-in attacks that I was talking about with a CBU or follow-up after we suppress some of the targets, and we would do that. Uh, one of the things that the F4G could do, because we didn't want to turn to the side, we'd actually lose some ranging on the thing. We would actually go straight in at it. You know, and this is kind of the fun stuff, and uh, you know, you kind of, it's tough to fly with your hands here with this thing, but anyway, you go in, you go straight at it, you're looking right at it, you pull up, it's under your nose, you never know where it is. You roll upside down just to make sure he's not shooting at you. And then when you get to the high point, you just pull it straight down. 
back again like that, roll out, and you, you never change your azimuths, and, and that way you get really accurate in it. Uh, a lot of fun. I'm not sure the technical significance, you know, you look at it, but it was fun to do. Direct pops, those are some of those others. And now you take a look at it. This is actually a true picture. Uh, I tried to find it on Snoops and all the other stuff, and uh, they didn't cover this one, but, but this is probably the most exciting weasel ride that you'll ever see, you know. That is a weasel on that airplane, on that airplane, on that, uh, that bird. Again, I kind of give you just an overview. I don't want to take too long. I, you know, I enjoy talking about it. Uh, I'd like to relate, you know, some personal experience. Actually, I'm, I'm a little ahead, so I'm going to, you know, take a few things, you know. I, I, you know, in every stage of your career, you, you tend to have, you know, that, that one, one mission that kind of stands out in all the other stuff. But uh, uh, it's, we got, our, our military is very well trained, you know, sleep well at night knowing that, and I do. We got some of the finest training, you know, in the world. We got, you know, when we needed equipment, we get it. We may not have it at the very beginning, but they're working for it. You know, the people on the ground, you know, that support you are doing great. Um, you know, the training that I got was, you know, top notch. Uh, you know, I had the red flag exercises that we have. You know, I don't know if you've heard those big mass exercises. We were learning that stuff, okay? And you, uh, I tell you, you got a lot of experience in doing that. And that's why I think, you know, at least as far as uh, Desert Storm and the Gulf War, you know, went so well. I mean, we were, we were looking at it from some of those Cold War scenarios, 20, 30 percent casualties, you know, you, you know, every mission could be your last and all. And when you look at it, we lost one airplane. And that one airplane, they call it for AAA because it lost gas. Uh, you know, but again, you know, you look at it, part of that was there just wasn't a good divert and, you know, bad situation, but they punched out, but basically with an empty jet, they ran out of gas. That's the only loss we had. We didn't have a combat loss. And uh, a little debatable, but as far as we can say, that if there's a weasel on station with a missile, uh, that we never lost uh, uh, a coalition aircraft. Weasel on station with a missile that, uh, we even tried a lot of times when we ran out of missiles, we stayed. They didn't know we didn't have any missiles left. And a lot of times what you can do is if they came up, you know, you, you know our, the call sign when you fired one of those things we called Magnum. You know, rifle you know, is, a, is the, the Maverick and all, but you know, yeah, you, Fox 1, if you all have heard, you know, the, like an air-to-air -air missile and all that, but Magnum. Well, the Iraqis figured that out real quick. So even if we didn't have missiles, we stayed around, and we could see when they came up, and if they came up as weasel police, and that's how we saved a lot of those missiles, we'd yell Magnum. And it's amazing, about, you know, two or three, four seconds later, they'd go down, and they'd hide. They didn't want to come on. You know, after that first two or three days, they realized anybody that radiated for more than 20, 30 seconds got a harm missile, you know. Oh, you know, you know, Ahmed, who was over in the, the SAM site over there, stayed on for 30 seconds, and he died, you know. So, you know, probably a good idea to stay down, you know, for, for less than that. As a matter of fact, a lot of the coalition aircraft started taking it upon themselves that as soon as their raw gear lit up, one of the tactics they used was to was to come up with one of the one of the call signs, you know, from the weasel aircraft, which were pretty easy to remember because we had all the beer call signs. We were Miller, we were Bud, <laughs> you know. You, you know, I think we were even Slits, Lone Star, you know, all those off brands and all the other stuff. And then he called Magnum after that. And a lot of times, you know, guys were saying afterwards, hey, you know, when we did that, they went down. They didn't even try to keep the, the missile going. Okay, hopefully we've been kind of entertaining. I've got uh, some of the, the training manuals and, and other things that we flew with. Uh, we'll give you all a little bit of a break, and then I think we'll reconvene. Or if you want to, yeah, we'll be up here to answer any of your questions and maybe share some of those missions with you uh, if you like you know, some other antidotes. But I really appreciate your attention, and thanks a lot. Okay.